Uh, first, I want to just thank everyone for coming tonight, uh, today. Um, this is really wild. A lot of my existence as an artist started in this church. Um, I feel like I've been doing weird performance things here for a solid 10 years now, maybe more. Um, so, I don't know. As frazzled as I was when I show up, I feel very at home sitting on this stage. Um, and I'm very happy to see people. Um, so what is this car? I don't know. Or hold up, before I do that, can my homies introduce themselves um, before I jump into things? Uh, yes, no, thank you, Jeremy. <laughs> uh, I'm Kamal Amu Patton. Uh, I'm from Brooklyn and also Lower East Side adjacent. So I spent a lot of time <laughs> in this area, so it's good to be in this space and be in this neighborhood. Uh, I'm Taja Cheek. I'm a musician and curator that has worked with Jeremy in many different capacities as friends and collaborators over the years. Cool. Um, oh, I'm also from Brooklyn. I, I feel like you mentioned this, so I have to also. <laughs> Um, and I, I think it's pretty obvious that I am not from Brooklyn, and that feels like an important thing to hold on to um, as we jump into the conversation. Um, so like, what is this car? This car is um, a decommissioned cop car from Baton Rouge, Louisiana, where I grew up as the grandchild of a police officer. Um, so there was a little bit of a, I guess, uh, of a serendipitous nature um, that, that pops up when uh, Jose Martos comes to me and says, I have this car um, and it's been handled by Olivier Mosse for the last few years and um, oh, you happen to be obsessed with the black square, Malevich's painting, Olivier has pasted, <clears throat> uh, placed black squares on the side of the car and it sort of just makes too much sense for you to not, to, it, makes too much sense for you to work with the car. Um, and so I spent some time out in Arizona. Um, Olivier had ripped out all of the sound components of the car, um, except for the like front, front speakers. The back two speakers were completely seized up. Um, so one of the first things for me was um, sort of wrestling this car from its history as a cop car. And my the way I understand that best being done is by making it loud and making it boom with bass. Um, to me, when I look at this car, I don't see a cop car. I see the way people who look uh, like me who lived in South Baton Rouge in the 80s and 90s um, sort of you can't reclaim some shit that belongs to the state that ultimately you paid for in the first place. Um, but you can do something with it that maybe uh, affects the way that it, 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 it affects people um, as you roll down the street. Um, so growing up, those were the cars that were blowing up the block. Those were the cars that were setting off alarms. Those were the cars that were making things shake on the walls. Um, and so to get it away from the copness of it, um, that felt like the first and, and maybe most important step. Um, so I put two 18 inch subwoofers in there and like a 5,000 watt amp just to like make it really, um, really intense. Um, but you'll notice that it's only intense on the outside. There's a way that I've sort of like designed the, in the, the flow of air and the flow of signal that the sound does not necessarily express itself outward. Um, and so it becomes a, an exciting space of interiority where the people in the car have a much different and maybe even richer experience of the sonic world and of the like automotive world than the people outside of it. Um, and that to me is like a fun thing when thinking about like the sort of like posturing and macho machismo that comes with like driving down the street and blowing up the block, even though that like may be a thing that people need to feel to feel good. Um, it's still complicated and sticky. And to me, for me to get around that, it's like bring that sound inside so that anyone experiencing that like sort of almost weaponized but also almost pleasurable sound um, 
they're electing into it and you can always get out of the car and walk away and say, I'm not fucking with this, um, which is also a very um, exciting way to go about making work. Like I'm not trying to hold anybody hostage, which is also why no one can get into the back seat. Um, the back seat still functions as a cop car. Once those doors are closed, um, you have to be let out and that's not a type of power or agency that I'm interested in commanding in my own work. Um, and I'll stop there. Okay, so the first time I saw this car was at, uh, was it Kino San Santo? Kino Sato? Kino, Kino Saito. Saito. Kino Saito, okay. So, and I, I believe the first time I got in it was in the back, or at least I did get in the back of the car. You're so, like one of two people. Yeah, so I kind of can't get away from the back of that car. Um, and all the things that it does. So I have a couple of questions also about um, comfort, right? And so the, the, the front of the car is actually really plush because I got it today. It was like, okay, this is like extra, is it leather, leather? No, it's, it's um, fabric. The f what? Yeah. Is it yeah, fabric? You know. Yeah, it's fabric, it, it's just. <laughs> They felt like a kind of a plushy, when I got it, it was dark, it's like kind of a, oh, we, are we? Okay, yeah. All right, so. <clears throat> it's the, the comfort plushiness of the front is the power zone, is the power zone that's there. And then there's the, the back end that in my experience has been like one that first time in your car and like and listening to it and feeling it but like prior to that my experience of similar cars are cabs and the police right and they're very different <laughs> vibes but still i don't know for those who are old school new yorkers i don't even know if they even still do this but the cabs used to have that plexi cage um, and there was a little like the hole. The, the, the hole <laughs> where it was like you could just get a little change in there and stuff your dollars, but still there, there uh, containment still has everything to do with that car for me, and being like locked away from whoever's in that driver's seat. So there's like, but you're always getting like carted to somewhere, and so you've neutralized some of that in the car. Um, because there's, there's no room really for luggage. Yeah. And there's like, the transaction is a little bit of a different transaction, but still it has that like, the matte black cage is, is heavy for me. You know, it's like, it's a, it's a, it's a heavy signifier that doesn't really um, go away. So in terms of the life cycle of the vehicle, um, yeah, I wonder about the whole transformation into like, I mean, it's still weaponized, it's still defiant. Yeah, I mean, right. I think it's instrumentalized. Like instrumentalized, I, okay. Like I'm hoping that it doesn't skirt into being weaponized. Like something that I'm also finding as I'm like continuing to work with crude and less crude tools of bureaucracy, state bureaucracy is that the shift from instrument to weapon is often intentional. Um, the, the LRAD, which makes its way into the performance later on, we understand primarily as a weapon until I let it sit there for 20 minutes after the performance and people are like, oh, there's a volume knob. Mm -hmm. Which means that this thing that gets used in an incredibly weaponizing way, not only to negatively mobilize people, um, or to negatively cart people, um, that is a decision that, that people are showing up to, to do. Um, and that's really sticky when these are all things, I'm gonna sound like a broken record, these are all things that people in this room pay for. Um, okay. So like, you know, the, the thing of the car, the thing of the LRAD, all of this is funded by public money. Um, and sustained by public money and there's like something sticky to paying for a type of potential subjugation that shows up and feels really important and why 
the, it, I mean, the, the cage the, never gets inhabited by people. It's at the service of, I mean, it's, they are agents of the, a, a community or a population who are under contract to perform certain duties, you know? And so that um, vehicle is an extension of how it fits into that, to its function, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, just like any vehicle is prepared for, um, you know, it's like that's the scope of its work. Um, but I, I guess when I was using the word like weapon, I'm, I'm trying to find a, a way to bridge the sonification part because, you know, I think about musicians and what musicians do with their tools, you know, with like a, a horn or a guitar or a sound system of some sort. I mean, it is, uh, there is a kind of extension of will. And I mean, we're talking about crowd control. So um, that, that object has the potential for a kind of um, control and like the nature of what that means. So with like sound, you can bring people together in a particular rhythm, right? And there'll be like an entrainment to that. So like, um, I mean, that's, if you're performing for dance or if you're like sermonizing, I mean, there's the whole notion of like the back and forth and the give and take that music and the tools of music allow. Um, but this kind of electroacoustic advice, device, um, I never felt like this, my experience wasn't like, okay, these are here to create this field of sound that we can then enter into and be like embraced by that and like create a, like a network of, or a community of sound. It's like a, tends to be this other like uh, aspect of like disorientation or neutralizing your, um, your sensory system or overloading your sensory system to the extent that then we become um, like together neutralized, right? Or destabilized. And then you have a mass of bodies that are connected by their like inability to move or function, right? I mean, um, so it's a kind of a, there was a question I was talking <laughs> to Samir Kapoor outside about um, if the bass frequencies that are coming out of the car, like what's that relationship to our bodies, you know? And if it's like, so, but I, I, that is a kind of, those are the thoughts I'm having is like, how do, how do these acoustic devices um, kind of interact or activate or destabilize um, our systems, yeah. right? And, you know, negotiating that without, you kind of purposefully <laughs> don't really give us many rules of engagement, right? So like, you know, I entered the car with you, I know you, I feel very comfortable being in a car with you. I remember being at Kino Saito, I'm pretty sure I was with some stranger and I was like, I hate this. <laughs> I like negotiating all these things about my body and how I feel and what the knobs do and like what I'm allowed to do in this car, what I'm not allowed to do in this car. And I'm like, and here is this other person that is <laughs> two, like, set, like two centimeters away from me and I have to do that with him in this car. Yeah, um, like that's having really a, the an experience together, but like absolutely wildly different. Yeah. Um, and like something I'm thinking about and hearing the way that you're both speaking is like, I feel like um, what was exciting about that evening at Kino Saito was it was like polar opposites of a type of positive manipulation. Um, your work like when I say manipulation, I'm not speaking with value. I'm like, you took me somewhere. Um, and that was with a type of intention. And that um, also feels like what I'm after is like a type of manipulation, but not one that asks people to, I'm, I'm not trying to manipulate anyone towards anything as opposed to create a circumstance of heightened, uh, sensation and um, experience within the thing. And I think for me, it comes out with these extreme low frequencies and the overloading of the senses because of my own hypersensitivity to sound and light. Um, so I'm also like, you know, I drove that car from Arizona to Rich, you know, 
from Arizona to Marfa to New Orleans to Atlanta to Richmond to New York. I spent a lot of time being just like hit with that bass and in some way to like deal with the hypersensory shit of being in the world, I had to overload my senses with that low frequency. And it's not unlike what I need when I go into a club. I don't enjoy clubbing, but if I'm gonna do it, like it has to like destroy me in a way that I can't turn off I, when I can't do this and the sound hits me in my body and like that that's really fucking complicated right um, this is what I'm talking with my students about and like the sticky nature of um, how we each have different needs of different frequencies and registers of frequencies and how sound is something that after a certain threshold sort of doesn't abide by um what we would consider boundaries. And that can be soul giving or it can be like destroying in a negative way. But yeah, you know, I think even, you know, the low frequency is still a power show. It feels like a power show. Um, and I have some questions about the other parts of the car. So I haven't driven in the car, but you know, my uh, memory, memory and experience of similar cars, they've had really soft suspensions. Um, is this like a heavy suspension? Is it rigid when it, when it moves or does it like... No, it's it like float? a boat. It's a boat. It's like a boat. Yeah. yeah. It's like... Mm -hmm. So, the, I mean, that and the base, it's just like a kind of liquid... It's like a womb kind of... I don't know. It's... It, it, because when you also, when you close the doors, it, um, it's like being in a refrigerator or something. It, yeah. like, it, it actually cuts off a lot of the ambient noise from outside. Yeah, I think that intensity of sound, like it becomes physical, even if it's not super material. Like it, when you close the doors, like that air pressure just stays in the car. It gets yeah. so hot and it's not just because it's hot outside. It's because that, that like, when the music is good in the space, it's not the ambient temperature of the room isn't just rising because the bodies are vibing. So the, because they're it's, moving, it's, but like it's, it's it's moving molecules like yeah. in, inside of the car and heating up the space. Yeah. So it's very easy for people to forget that like that's how speakers work. They move. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's they move. Like it's a kinetic object. Yeah. So actually thinking about the car as an object, I want to ask y'all um, as New Yorkers who. Um, have both expressed to me that you have a very different relationship to cars in general. And with that, I'm assuming like this type of car audio culture kind of thing. Um, like Taja, you've spoken about like very recently driving and, and things like this. And Kamal, you also spoke about like driving coming, driving coming later. Yeah. Um, and wonder if the shift from trains and walking and bikes and things like this to driving has shifted. Yeah, what is that doing to your relationship to cars? How do you see how that base is hitting, how, to, how that thing is functioning now? Huh, it's interesting. I feel like there actually is a car culture in New York. Like, I, didn't, I don't know how to drive. I don't have a license. Most of my friends from New York don't have a license, but you, you know the sound of like particular cars and how they move through space. You can hear like an ice cream truck and you know exactly where it is and where it's parked. You understand like the Doppler effect of like the pitch changing as it crosses you. You understand, understand the sound of a police car and what that does. Um, so it's just like a different relationship to moving vehicles, but it's definitely there. And I think of like the summertime and people blasting music from cars or like there's certain car, certain sound, like songs <laughs> and sounds that you can't get away from that can bring you back to a particular point of time because that was what was playing on Hot 97 that year, right? So there is like, there is a car culture, but it's more, it, and it is mostly experienced from, I think, outside, or at least for me and a lot of my friends, it's, it's experienced as like through a wall, through glass, through many different layers. When was the first time you got into a car with that type of base? I'd have to think about that. I don't know. I was probably very young. 
Yeah, my parents had a car, and my dad uh, liked to play music very loud. <laughs> but it's also like thinking about it now too. I think there is like a like musicians also have very specific relationships to cars. There's a lot of bands who mix their albums in cars because that's how most people are going to be listening to it. I like doing that. Whenever I have a new mix of something, I, I try to like borrow a friend's car, like sit in it and like give them a sneak peek of it because I know that's how most people are going to be hearing it. Um, and I think there's something also like seductive about like a car bass and I feel like that's something that's actually sold a lot. Like if any commercial headphones, usually the way that they're EQ'd, they're EQ'd with the bass turned way up and that's like good sound <laughs> because you can yeah. hear the low frequencies, right? And I feel like it's the same thing in cars. Like that's really kind of sold as what is like good sound to a public that maybe doesn't know a lot about sound, but that's what you associate with something that you should be buying that's right and it's very like commercial. In but, that it, way. but it's like not audiophile cool, right? Like audiophiles hate that shit. And exactly. they're like, it's not neutral. Mm -hmm. But before I go off, I'm going to stop. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, I didn't learn how to drive till I'm, I mean, I moved to California in like, was it 96, 97? And then I learned how to drive there. Um, so there's a whole kind of part of my, my history with cars and car culture and custom culture and all that was really like Bay Area car culture. Um, here in New York, there were a couple of cats on the block that like got cars, but it was, that was a little extra. I mean, then there was, you know, the music coming out, a lot of dance hall, right? So um, for sure, like, you know, that was in terms of like bass music, but I feel like hip hop, at least in the time that I was kind of like really focused and the whatever, like New York hip hop is kind of mid range. Mm -hmm. It's really lyrically driven. So you don't get as much of that low end kind of muddiness. And yeah. that even the kick is like very like dry. Yeah. And, like, and I feel like that's kind of part of like what the whole like resistance to Southern and West Coast hip hop was. It was like, there's something about the sound of the, um, just like the keynote sound of the music that didn't really register here, you know? Um, because that low frequency is more like, that's the train, right? That's a subway frequency. And it doesn't really get registered in the same way because it has like a kind of gritty rumble to it. So, I mean, if you listen to like, like for instance, like Master Ace, like Master Ace came out with um, Born to Roll, and that was like a kind of crossover, but it was rumbly, do you know what I mean? It was like, it was almost like acid, you know? But um, yeah, there's, and that's also kind of the vehicle itself, because the vehicle's a little bit more rattly, you know? Um, so that vehicle does hold sound in this kind of way. And then when you see that as like a Southern and West Coast kind of car that gets converted, a lot of the cars, I feel like that, um, I mean, I feel like there was like Celicas and Hondas, like just some things that were a little bit more like thinner and rattly, <laughs> you know? So it would just register. Um, I mean, in the same way, if you see like a, like when djembe drums, when you play a djembe, like there's resonators that you put into it that make that rattle, which is like, that's calling the spirit, you know what I'm saying? Because we're yeah. spiritual people out here. So <laughs> like, it does have, so that hum, that extra bzzz, which also you see in um, Mbira oh, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. That was, that's more of the nature of the sound. Um, but uh, either way, I guess, um, yeah, that's that's kind of what came to mind in terms of like what the car, um, like what the sound of a vehicle really was, and then also the signifier was like you're not from here because that was a lot of like would you like bridge and tunnel type of thing. So it's like if you came into the city with a car or where you were just like well, who is driving with like where are you even from? You from Jersey or whatever? You know what I mean? It was like it was very that, you know. So it wasn't until I was later on where I was like I can embrace this concept yeah of. that's wild <laughs> that's a really that's a really good point actually that like the sound of the bass is often just the sound of the car yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. and how that comes back to all the questions around like purity and neutrality that you were talking about but i hadn't thought about like 
bass rattles being like an ultra black thing in that particular way and it like totally is it's about like the rattle of the car which is like i feel i'm gonna be confessional and say that i was after the rattle and the fact that it doesn't rattle is a consistent like thorn in the side of my blackness i just feel like my <laughs> <laughs> i'm joking um i no, but i was after the rattle because like it feels good when I hear a car go down the street in that way now um, and it was like something that I was excited to have this work be a part of in terms of like lineage and, and com like sort of like conceptual community um, it's just by happenstance like when I've taken this car to have looked at by like super audio people um, who do car things they're really upset that there's not lining in the back to keep it from rumbling but it doesn't yeah. happen anyway so I'm you know, not gonna pursue the failure because then the car would become theater in a way. Um, but there is kind of a, a thing that feels sad to me that like it doesn't rumble in that way. And like, it's not for lack of power or anything like that. Um, I guess the Interceptor or the Crown Vic is built beefy for a reason. Yeah. Reason. Um, it's funny too, because like thinking about how the sound of a place, or how you know ambient sounds change based on how you are. Um, like when I have brought this car to southern cities, cars with the thing overpower it when you're outside of it. Yeah. Because um, the rattle is an added thing. Like the bass isn't traveling that far. It's that rattle yeah. that that is going far. And like it's kind of exciting to have the like art moment just be like pushed aside or like cast over by reality, which is a thing that brought me here in the first place. Okay, so you, uh, I guess, brought me to this question of um, inter interiority and the experience of the exterior of the car, which, you know, thinking about the LRAD long range acoustic device, um, you know, I was, when I first um, encountered you and the car, I saw that device, I was like, oh, okay. And it, I mean, it has a, you know, um, a range finder. Like if you're within a certain cone of sound, like you have 10 feet or one feet or whatever, you know, it's all these things um, based upon um, your proximity to the sound source, right? A long range acoustic weapon, right? Anyway, so I'm wondering about the interior of the car and the consciousness of making that car so um, kind of soundproof, right? Is that to protect the um, whoever is deploying that sound on the outside from the sound that they're deploying, which essentially like neutralizes everything that's around it. So for me, that's a kind of, um, it's a complication of the car. Um, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't know if that's, if that read is correct. Okay, cool. But the windows go up and down though, right? They the windows do go up and down, yeah. yeah. Um, they're a little squeaky because there's some adhesive on them, but you know, life. Um, yeah, the windows do go up and down, which like is a nice thing that releases pressure from the car into the, into the space, which like for those who got into the car, when the windows go down, it feels like a release. Yeah. Um, and when they go back up, it's like a, a recontainment. Um, but with that, with that release, like it lets things out, but it also means that things can come in. Um, so when the, when the LRAD is playing, there's a, comp there's a separate, a, a, a sort of further portion of this performance, like I'm sort of thinking of it as um, an acapella, what happened earlier, and a full version later tonight, where this LRAD will be present playing a composition at a louder volume. Um, and what happens when you're inside of the car is that the bass is so intense that it negates the, the sort of weaponized son of sonic nature of the LRAD. Um, and that was something that I found in experimenting um, like as a performance practice, but what I was excited about initially was that the thing was much, much a space of interiority. Um, when I first got those subwoofers and everything put in there, I cranked it and realized that my phone couldn't hear me. So like, you know, the assistant couldn't catch me. Um, when I would talk to people in the car, it would sound like yelling into a fan. Um, so like what 
the, the things spoken about inside of the car really became intimate and spoken about inside of the car. And like, that is, it is a protection. And that is a really exciting thing to have, ex ex to have discovered in like an, a, an experimental practice. Um, but there's also something really wonderful about like the incapturability of the conversations that happen inside. Yeah, I mean, can you also maybe talk about some of the histories of the car, um, the different, I mean, because you, <clears throat> you painted it after receiving it, right? So yeah. first it was uh, acquired by Martos Gallery, who worked with the artist Scott Campbell, who's a tattoo artist and visual artist in New Orleans. Uh -huh. um, and so that's where you see, this car is on its fourth life as a project car. Um, and I think what's really exciting about it is that instead of completely starting over from a blank thing, like there's a little mark of everyone's life with it, with it. Um, so Scott did some incredible flash uh, style art on the car, um, as well as the etchings on the window that you see. And after that, I think it went to John Paul Williams III. And after that, it went to Olivier Mosse, who repainted the car back to its original like um, state maroon um, and put these black squares on the, on the side and took all the sound out. And um, when I got a hold of it, I painted over his black with a darker black, um, which peels off. So his work still shows through in a really exciting way. I think, um, and I put those two subwoofers in there and two dash cams on the front and back so that I could document the performance of driving from Arizona to Richmond. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, legend has it before this, it was, it was a cop car in Minneapolis at some point. I verified that because in cleaning the car out, I found a stack of, tink a stack of tickets um, <laughs> for Minneapolis Police Department. Um, which is wild because I also lived in Minneapolis for a year-ish. Um, and legend has it before that it was from Baton Rouge, Louisiana, which again is where I grew up, where my grandfather was a cop. Um, this is a 2009 model, so I, you know, my grandfather passed in 03 or 04. I can't like get that poetic about it. It's not like he ever came in contact with it, but the, the shit of it is, you know, it's kind of too perfect, even though it's also kind of too much. And with this kind of car, I mean, it would always be that, right? Because this type of car is going to live a life as a police interceptor, maybe as a, someone's custom car, maybe as a cab, maybe as, I don't know, any number of things that it could potentially be. And yeah, so in a way, I feel like <clears throat> to, you would, to be not authentic, but to kind of honor the car and your relationship to the car like yeah just leaving a kind of trace of its history does make us a, a, make sense yeah I, and it like i also really appreciate the other artist's contribution to the car like it is a cool car um and in that way it's also like the residue is exciting and like the weird like it's not a collaboration i would never deign to say that it's a collaboration but like it's almost like an exquisite corpse kind of thing but like way better than any version of it i've ever experienced in like a weird um noodly dance rehearsal yeah um so okay um this is maybe a because i did say yes just because i was like yeah sure i'd say well i, I try to say yes <laughs> but to most things i try um and I didn't really ask a lot of questions about why, but like, I'm now that I'm here, I'm like, well, why? Why are we here? You know what I mean? Like, what's what what's what what kind of role do we play? I've seen one other person play out of it. I don't think I've s saw you play out of it, but still, I'm just trying to figure that. Y'all got excited. Out. Yeah. <laughs> like I I saw your response yeah. to the car to people that you were with at Kino Saito. Yeah. And it felt special to me. Like you were, the way that I read it is like you were really stoked on something that it was doing. And I think Taja got in the car and just like started laughing. 
or something similar. <laughs> um, and just like, I don't know, there was something about the, the, the it of how y'all, how I read y'all's responses that felt like, let's talk about this. I mean, there's this related project, The People's Bus, that's kind of like around, I don't know, I'm still wrapping my mind around it. The idea of like reclamation versus just destruction and, you know, what times are appropriate for which. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I think when I was first in the car, I think I started laughing because I was so deeply uncomfortable. I didn't know what else to do. I felt truly horrible <laughs> sitting in that car I don't think I was in it for very long and it was really powerful but there was a part of me that was just like why can't we just destroy this car <laughs> like can we just like get rid of this object like what, what what are we doing I think it is doing something interesting but yeah it's just it, I'm just wondering about those two things and for you if that's something that you are thinking about or grappling with which I imagine you are <laughs> yeah I mean like <sighs> There's a reason that the car is there, and there's also re a reason that the LRAD is there. Um, I mean, I have a very specific reason for purchasing LRADs. There aren't very many of them out there, so like I'm, you know, for every one I get, that means no one else can get it. And think about who wants that, um, and also can't magically wish them out of existence. And the act of destruction would be one that like doesn't change the thing like those cars still exist um they will continue to exist unfortunately um despite our un until now you know like despite our efforts they continue to exist um so like destroying one wouldn't go far enough for me um and there's also something like like when i was when i did the performance in atlanta right before I started it, like a line of people in Crown Vicks raised up with 20 inch wheels and bass that was doing something really crazy rolled up. And that's just where they were hanging out that day. And that was a reminder to me that like, you, right, we can't disappear them from existence and there's a history of people doing exciting things with them. Um, so with that, how can I like just lean into the complicated nature of this in the same way that I can't pretend to not have grown up in a house where police were present. Um, so I have to lean into the complication of that and use that as a space of interrogation. Totally. I mean, Oof, that's an awful word in a question a query. Yeah, I hear you. I hear you. I mean, <laughs> I mean, seeing seeing the car at Kino Saito is one thing, and seeing it like here is a very, very different thing. And there's this moment, I hope this isn't bad to reveal, but there's this moment where, you know, an NYPD car was just kind of like sitting in the exact spot where we were expecting you to arrive. Um, and we, <laughs> I was in a group with Nikita and Alex, we were kind of looking at each other very nervously and then they got out of the car and came up into the building and there's this moment where we're like, wait a minute, are these things connected? And it's like, they are and they aren't, right? Um, and like this context is like an important one, I think, but it was just like very darkly poetic to see the cops occupying the exact literal space that you were about to occupy. Can I, can I just, okay, so there's a couple of things. Definitely seeing the car the first time, I was, I was uncom uncomfortable by it because I was like, okay, this is, um, mostly I was uncomfortable by the comfort of the community that it was the audience. Yes. I was like, what, why or is everybody out here just chilling? Or it just is like, and it's been, there were children around, so I was like, okay, like, if there was a 45, you know I mean, if there was a gun right there on the lawn, would people feel like, oh, yeah, there's a gun right there? You know I mean, like, not active, just sitting there, and people would be like, oh, that's a weapon, you know? And then I was like, okay, well, that, to me, is like having a loaded weapon in a way, you know? It has the potential for all these things, and it has all these histories, so as I felt... I didn't, I, I wasn't choosing to, I wasn't really trying to, I was like, I just felt it, right? So, um, and there was something about that tension that I was like, all right, I got, 
drawn in to um, what was happening. Um, but I mean, coming to it, it, it wasn't, it's not just having had my history of experience with like, okay, this police person is trying to like apprehend or I have been apprehended, you know, it, whatever, it's just all these things. Like I have the, those experiences, but the other part is, um, whatever they are, who they are, but my neighbors are police officers. <laughs> And like they be, they park in the, they don't have to worry about parking. And I'm always mad at that because like parking in New York is crazy. And my police neighbors just be like parking and like, yo, that's a no parking spot. And you got your, and it's not even, we it's like, yo, it he has there. a BMW. It's like, yo, why you got your white BMW in the no parking spot where you know it actually causes problems, you know, and the, every, the whole, this forever. You know what I mean? It was forever, like, that kind of, uh, I found that an abusive privilege. Do you know what I mean? And, like, never getting tickets. And everybody else on the block is getting tickets. But you, and you give it tickets? I was like, nah, be like, <laughs> that's it's terrible. Like, so anyway, I have that, you know, anxiety. Every time I was like, oh, look, you parked on the lawn right here, too. Like, <laughs> no, I'm, like, keeping an eye out on the front to, like, see what's, what's good. Um, also, I'm like, you know, let's invite some cops to sit in the car with me. <laughs> I'm dead ass, honestly, because, you know, like what happens when they're reminded that they're people and that they're not crude tools of the state and that there is a human, well, there could be a human in there. Um, and yeah, I'm, okay. yeah. I'm going to, okay, I can't really, like, I'm going to just say that like invite we, all, your neighbors. we are all, we're human beings that like play particular roles and perform things. You go to work and you're like, I'm, now I'm in this mode and I'm going to perform that. And there's you know, a moment at which you'll just be like, okay, well, um, this is not what I signed up for, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and I think, yeah, there's people that do make those, those choices. Um, but I guess, okay, so back to like the job itself, right? So who, who becomes like a cop or a police officer, right? This is my neighbors did, do you know what I mean? And that, that was like a liberation moment in terms of like, having a job with benefits and like there's levels at which you are like the department or you per participating same as like I have you know friends family community that are became firemen you know or MTA is a big you know um spot I was flying back from Chicago the other day which I worked there I go back and forth and this woman was coming back I was like oh you know she was chilling she was like on her second gin and tonic or whatever she was drinking you know what i'm saying she was really like lean like she was chilling i was like all right cool she's like well i'm going to back to new york to sign my paperwork because she was retiring from the mta mm -hmm. right and um i was like okay cool like so the job itself and other kind of jobs in that category of jobs are complicated to the extent that they are a kind of site for empowerment and liberation i mean you talk about your own family has officers so that's a complication and then the histories of that and what it even does that mean when you're talking about the history of like people of color and being um uh <laughs> in states of um bondage and like who and what are the hierarchies and levels of like who's policing and who's controlling you know like the histories of that are like complicated so to say like oh okay cool so like still continues this happens within communities that like there is a class of police that are like able to buy property able to like move in a particular way are not dealing with the same set of laws um are able to like generate a kind of like wealth and empowerment and safety that is not going to be applied across the entire community so like those histories if you I mean, you, you, and the histories of surveillance, which is all related to like tools and techniques and technologies coming out of slavery and post emancipation, um, the United States. It's like all of these things. So, you know, can you like, yeah, we're just a person being a cop. No, <laughs> no, but I think at the other, on the other side, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Um, no. Like on the other side, I think it's important to acknowledge that every, every person outside of this door is a fucking cop. Yeah. Like the, the, the thing, not, not only in terms of like self-surveillance via social media and, and technology and things like that, but everybody outside of here is, and, and you know, maybe people in here, and that's not meant to be an indictment. Um, people are, uh, 
as, as creatures, we are property obsessed and we are concerned, right? Like people police one another. I'm not, I'm, I am deathly worried about the cops, but when I go home to Ohio, I'm also worried about the fact that my neighbors are policing me. And when I'm talking about reminding people that cops have a human in them, I'm also trying to remind people that like, it's real easy to slip into some cop shit. Um, and, and trying to make the case for like, a better way of moving about things, um, which isn't trying to be like, we are the world, let's hold hands and, and do the thing. Like, I'm like, let's sit in the space and have the difficult conversations. Let's go back into the cave and like continue to hash it out. So the role exists and it's interchangeable, just like these cars exist. They were made and like, they're gonna cycle through different departments. They're gonna cycle through different, um, owners who deploy them for what they were designed for, modify them and take that and do their, all of these things. But what I'm getting at is like, it is an infrastructure that is growing and growing to the extent that like, it's easy to participate in it. And yeah, most of us are participating in that on some level, right? So. Uh, this, this is, I think, the, the kind of energy that's in, when I saw the car and I was like, when it all kind of hit me and it added up, I was like, all right, okay, here I am, you know, and I'm implicated in this to extent that it's working on me, right? It's like yeah. already I mean, I'm kind of Short of like, like a tax thinking. strike, we're all implicated yeah, all so. the time, no matter what. I felt, <laughs> I was reminded of a moment during the performance upstate where I think you were just like <laughs> explicitly yelling at the cops and just re <laughs> remembering the like genuine fear I felt in that moment being there and remembering the people that were around that space and how they looked at me <laughs> and they weren't cops, but I knew that they, at any point they could become one <laughs> and how like, you know, literally just like taking up sonic space opens up a whole other relationship. Um, and I'm just like, I rem I'm, rem I'm remembering that fear of just being like, I gotta go. Yeah. I don't know if I'm ready for this right now. I can't, I don't know if I can do this at this moment. Yeah. <laughs> it's wild when someone gets into the car with that energy, like someone who's like, us, one way or another policing my body and the way that it shows up, because I have tattoos that say certain things and depict certain things that people have feelings about. Um, or the presence of the car or the presence of the LRAD, and it's like not a thing of concern, because this is art, you can always walk the fuck away. I'm not holding anybody hostage, right? So like, what is it when you make the decision to get in the car with me and be like, so what's up with that tattoo of the AK-47 on your arm, buddy? Um, like that's a decision to like, not be in the work and to like, assert your concern over the circumstance, which could ultimately lead to a type of policing. It's a very, very, very slippery and sleep sto s steep slope. Yeah, but it's, it's also just real life. Like, I was afraid for Facts. you. Facts. <laughs> I was like, in my head, I had all these other, like, like, all these scenarios running around. I was like, okay, if this happens, I'll do this. If this happens, I'll do that. You know, like, literally, like, in that moment, just, like, doomsday prepping is to be like, okay, like the work is the work, but also we are in a real space with Where real people exits. who may be very crazy and may try to inflict harm on like you, you know what I mean? So yeah, it's the, the context really matters Certainly. that the car is in and it becomes like very real, very quickly and very personal and very like intense. Certainly. Um, this sucks. I think we're out of time. Yeah. Did we, did we, Could, did you want questions? Yeah. Could we take a few minutes and do questions? Does anyone have any um, we'd like to? Yeah. Do you want to run out? Noise is a tool, I think. And I am careful about where and when and how I use it. Um, and it is meant to be aggressive, <laughs> but I'll only really employ it in very specific instances and I've noticed how the same sound some people will pick up on it as an act of love and something to kind of um, share a collective experience around of rage and of grief 
and mostly, you know, black people, black femmes in particular, I've noticed that at shows and how that exact same sound <laughs> can be read as very disruptive and I've had lots of people kind of like very angrily come up to me at shows or write to me and talk to me about that and it's like pretty much without fail that is the way it always shakes out <laughs> um, and I become intentional about that and used to like end my shows like that intentionally to say like okay are you with me or are you not with me <laughs> and I can tell a lot about like how we relate as people based on like this moment um but yeah there's so there's so much um just fucked up language wrapped into how um we produce sound there's like mastering there's like the gendering of oh my like, god the gendering cable like it's just so stupid <laughs> why why <laughs> there's no reason for it um and it's hard to find a way out of it because it is such a shared language and a language that we really rely on to be able to communicate specific things not only that but it's also um something that people feel a lot of judgment around if you don't know what a cable is called and like which end is which or whatever right so it's hard to find a way out of that right like there should be another word rather than mastering, but I can't, you know, if I talk about it, I can't. <laughs> no right. one knows what I'm talking about. Or like, you know, you can have, like, one one program can be a slave to another program, right? Like, so ridiculous. Like, like it's, it's baked absurd. into the language of MIDI, which is like yes. baked into the language and history of electronic music. And like, I don't know what it might look like to try and disentangle or come up with different different language around that. I've been trying to task my students with thinking about what is an XLR cable that isn't... Um, a male end or a female end, or like what is MIDI control beyond master slave? What does the finished sonic product exist like when it's not like when it's finished, but like might we consider consider it something other than mastered? Because also when it's mastered, right? There's no room for surprise. There's no room for relation. It's like become an object, um, and in a way that kind of like undermines the potential of like what sound can do. Like when it becomes done. an object, <laughs> yeah, it's done. I mean, yeah, it's for a particular kind of transaction after that. Um, and also what's expected of the mastering process, right? Like, I, I'm, well, I, I won't say that, but <laughs> <laughs> having gone through many processes of mastering a record, you know, it's usually where um, the dynamics disappear, yeah. where things become really bass heavy. There's like very like specific expectations of what happens during that process, specifically to make it more commercially viable yeah. for those headphones that have the bass cranked up, right? Like it's that's also kind of interesting it's, is that like all of the sort of artistic decisions can fall away because it's being basically crafted and shaped for a you know for sale. Because that, I mean, when you're talking about noise, I, I think about noise as the thing that isn't wanted. So, like, everybody has a noise that they're going to label. It's like, oh, okay, maybe that bass is like, oh, that bass is terrible, actually, that's noisy, whatever. And you just name the noise of whatever the thing that is, like, the aberration, any, the thing that is just like, get that out of here. So noise is on a spectrum and noise is, like, is kind of like elusive thing that is pretty fluid, right? Um, but to use that feels very much in line what you're talking about in terms of like how to liberate oneself. Um, Cause like that, that s spectrum of sound to like find uses for it and to deploy that um, at one time creates <clears throat> a community around that and then is its own kind of defense against those who are not tuned to that, right? So, um, yeah, it's, 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 I think, a really useful space to occupy. Um, oh, I went to this, um, there's this fancy speaker maker um, that sells speakers that are completely unaffordable for anyone, really. <laughs> um, and he's been building these speakers forever. They're very fancy. They sound very good. Um, and I was there um, as like complicated reasons, but I was there and I was listening to 
um, music and I put on one of the last low records which has so much digital distortion that's used like in an artistic way purposefully and the, <laughs> the second that that was put on he started yelling I was just like, I spent my whole life trying to make sure I never hear this sound coming from these speakers. Yeah. And like, you know, just like the level of like craft and technique that comes into building these speakers. And I'm just playing the sound that literally is making the exact sound that he's just like, you know, no, no one wants to hear because, you know, it's digital distortion. You try not to have that. And that's like the whole basis of this whole record sound. And that was like a really formative moment for me <laughs> where I was like, oh, right this is correct, this is great, this is pushing something forward, this is actually really important. Also, you should have said you're welcome. <laughs> like, imagine being, like, imagine being surprised by what your own shit can do and thinking that's a bad thing. Exactly, um, or what music can do, right? Yeah. What sound can do, like, he, on the flip side, he totally could have been like, oh, right, this is like, this is so amazing, I've never heard anything like this before, but he was just like, turn this shit off immediately. <laughs> wow. Um, does anyone else have any questions before we wrap up and take a break? Johan. I wanted to talk about the life cycle of the car and, and particularly about the legality of the car. Um, I feel like the, un, the unmarked police car subverts visibility in publics and is in some ways um, outside of the rules of engagement of, of, of what we think about when it talk, or the visibility of policing and being able to actually see um, the the actors of the state, um, it's in some in some ways above the law, right? Um, and uh, but now, as as a as a mobile sonic sculpture, as this this site of performance, um, I'm wondering how that legality has changed with this car. Do you do you feel like the car has become more or less legal? Um, I know I, it sounds like it is street legal. You are actually able to take it out on the road and drive it. Yeah. But how has how the legality of that car changed um, as it's kind of transformed into a different kind of object? Yeah, my understanding is that after it was a cop car, there was a lot of um, mechanical and electronic work that had to be done to keep it from reaching a certain speeds in a certain time, but also like the lights, the siren, like all of the accoutrement um, are still present in the car, but the cables have been cut and things like this. Um, and I think like one of the things that shows up, what, that, that comes up when I'm hearing you talk, Johan, is um, like in driving that car across the country, I realized that people saw me as a cop. Um, so then it means I have to be like, even though I have a 14 hour drive from Marfa to Baton Rouge, I have to be careful about how I'm showing up on the road to not like, you know, in engage in even the slightest unintentional like um, terrorization of someone's psyche via my presence in this vehicle. Um, and it's also like kind of funny when like, you know, people slow down and, and pull to the right. And I'm also not going fast either because speeding doesn't save time for one. But also um, like I pull up next, I, I cruise next to them and they're like, <sighs> and that's like almost funny, but it's also upsetting um, to think that like that, not that, you know, I understand the fire that I'm messing with in this situation, but like, how many times do people experience that feeling per day? Yeah, um, I mean, and that's, that's not nothing. And because of that, I rarely ride in the left lane. Um, I don't drive aggressively in general, but like, I'm just really slow and low about it. Um, and I've been pulled over in the car also. So it like, you know, I think especially in the South where the car sits on a different register, um, like the cops knew that, it, they, that I wasn't a cop, um, but, and, and pulled me over because they didn't know what I was, but they knew I wasn't a cop. So he pulled me over and needed to know what the hell I was doing. Why did the windows look like this? What are these etchings? What is this thing on the side of the car? He literally said, is this art or something? Um, <laughs> And yeah, I can't excise, I, I can't do anything but implicate myself in the history and also like the nowness of the car um, because of my own family history. So like, again, leaning into the complicated nature of all that shit um, while also trying to like 
not do harm with my art or like not even do like happenstantial harm through this thing. How did you answer that question? I said, yes, it's a performance and I'm documenting right now and you're on camera. How do you feel? <laughs> I was wondering if you're like, it's art. <laughs> I mean, but he was also, he, he, he was also like a, a weird, like he was playing, playing good, right? Like he was smiling and like very convivial about it. And I'm like, come on now, come on now. You hopped over the median to get to me off the interstate. Um, you can feed me the nice thing, but like I know what the game is. Yeah, it's art. I have um, uh, Brittany Maldonado, who is the gallery assistant at Martos, on the phone right here and right now. Um, if you need to, we can FaceTime. Also, the dash cams are going, so this entire re interaction is being captured via film and audio. So, like, whatever you think you're about to get into, you're also implicated in. And also, it's streaming. It's streaming and uploaded immediately. So, like, what you want to do? Um, and that's not some shit that I bring with me from growing up in a family of cops that like f I don't fuck you is like coming from experiences dealing with cops like you're gonna do what you're gonna do um, it's gonna be what it is but at, it's recorded and I, we can do what we want with that I think maybe that's our time um, thank you all for coming thank those of you who stayed I appreciate y'all Thank you, Kamau. Thank you, Taja. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Martos. Thank you, Triple Canopy.